Right, so I'm going to give you a sort of crash course update on sort of what's happening in the world, particularly through um, the rapid acceleration of technology. And um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of macro trends, probably the greatest events of our time from my perspective and kind of what that means for the world today. Um, we live in a really, really remarkable time, right? I mean, there, 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 are, there are some unprecedented events that are occurring which, which make it an absolute golden age. And really, the first macro trend of our time is software is eating the world, right? Mark Andreessen um, recently said this, well, uh, and I think in the New York Times, um, but um, if you look across the world today and every industry is waking up quite disruptively to understand it's a software business. Uh, the biggest direct marketing company in the world today is a software company. It's Google, right? No longer do we, you know, think that the optimum way to kind of advertise your business is buying a billboard in the street somewhere or putting ad in a newspaper or advertising on a radio station or a TV station, right? It's done through software. The fastest growing telecommunications company in the world is a software company. It's Skype, which is Microsoft. The biggest bookseller in the world, the biggest shoe seller in the world is a software company. It's Amazon. We used to read physical books. Now it's done in software. We used to do scrapbooking with pieces of paper and scissors. Now it's software, Pinterest. We would write things on a piece of, pad, you know, piece of paper with a pen. Today it's software, things like Evernote. We would look at a map, a physical map, a street directory. It's now software. We would search with physical items like yellow pages. It's now software. We would listen to music with records and CDs. It's now software. It's Spotify and iTunes. You know, fashion is now turning into software. You know, point of sale is now software. Money is turning to software with PayPal and Bitcoin and, and so forth. Real estate, this is a company I'm chairman of, is going to disrupt the, the, the real estate industry. But you know, we don't go down to you know, the, the storefront today in every single suburb of Australia and look through those little glass uh, windows into little bits of cardboard and find houses. We go to software and we go to domain or real estate to basically find a place to rent or buy. My company is uh, disrupting the, the jobs industry with software. We'd hang out with friends in person. Today we do it with software via Facebook. We would take photos of the camera, we do it with software with Instagram. We would go rent a video, today it's software, it's iTunes. We'd go to Flight Center to go book our travel, today it's software, 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 software. And even drug dealing today is done in software. Mary Meeker from Kleiner Perkins calls this the reimagination of everything. Every industry is waking up quite disruptively to discover it's a software business, and they're not ready for it. And I think that's really exciting in many different ways. The second big macro trend which is happening today is the other 70% of the world's population are about to join the internet. It's pretty hard to believe somewhere like here, but 7 billion people on the planet, 2 billion people online, 70% of the world's population have yet to connect to the internet, which is a pretty amazing fact. And this is, this is a trend that I built my entire company on, right? If you look around the... The world, I mean, you've got, you know, you've got penetration that's saturating in places like North America and Australia and so forth, but you go to places like Asia, only 20% connectivity in the whole of Asia, right? Four billion people. Africa, virtually no connectivity because the internet really hasn't penetrated to a great deal there, 10% connectivity and so on. Even Latin America, 34% connectivity. But it's coming in a big way, double-digit, triple-digit growth, right? Already the top 10 US consumer internet websites, 80% of the traffic comes from foreign sources. We're talking Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and, and so on. In the last three and a half years, more people connected to the internet in China than the entire population of the United States of America. So we're moving from a very Western, Anglo, English-speaking centric world on the internet to one which is more inclusive where, you know, English is not the most widely spoken language in the world, right? You've got, you know, Mandarin and so forth, right? You've got, you know, 600 million, I think 1.6 billion uh, Spanish speakers globally and so on. And the other 5 billion people are on an average wage somewhere around $8 a day or less, in some circumstances, substantially less. And so the first thing they do when they go online is they're looking to raise their, you know, their economic status, right, by finding a job after they check out YouTube and Facebook like everyone else. And remarkably, it's never been easier to learn a trade. Today, I can go online and through software, I can basically, if I want to design a, a logo, I can go to watch a video on YouTube or I can go to a site like this. This is an Australian company, Invato, who produce, publishes a whole bunch of its tutorials online. If I want to learn quantum mechanics, I can go to Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and I can learn quantum mechanics, right? All the course materials, they're online for free for you to read. And in fact, there's a whole revolution occurring in education which is going to have massive impact, particularly in the developing world where 
um, courses now being taught online. I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but this is uh, Udacity. This is a lecturer from Stanford, uh, Sebastian Thrun, who teaches a second year computer science class called Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. This is my former university. And normally, you know, if I, when I was back at Stanford, you'd go to this class, there'd be 200 people in the class, it'd be delivered conventionally, right? Last year, he said, I will teach this online. I will mark every single assignment that gets submitted. I will mark every single exam that gets submitted. And I'll give you a little certificate at the end. And it's free. 170,000 people enrolled, which is eight and a half times the entire population of Stanford. 25,000 people graduated. Of the top 453 people that graduated, and it was mixed in with the Stanford students, not one single Stanford student, right? This is going to absolutely change the world. He has now announced he's going to offer a master's degree, and the lecturers at Udacity, which is an online university, are from Stanford, they're from Harvard, they're from MIT. $100 for a master's degree, right? $1 a subject is the business model. At the moment, it's still free, but this class, 170,000 people enrolling, that'd be $170,000 for that one subject, right? Delivered all online with software. Khan Academy is another example, this guy. He was in the finance industry. He wanted to teach his, um, his, his nephews how to, um, um, about mathematics. He put some YouTube videos together. The whole thing took off. And um, you know, now he's got several thousands of these videos out there. And they go all the way from elementary calculus right through to rocket science and venture capital. And I kid you not, there is actually a class on rocket science, right? And um, Bill Gates came and gave him $20 million. This is all for free. And he's basically educating the world. And the universities, for example, in Australia are about to get the rudest shock of their lives because their business model is about to collapse. They're completely funded on um, students coming from places like India and China to study and do a master's degree fee paying. That's going to dry up. Why would I pay $40,000 a year to go to Sydney University when for $100 I get a master's degree from Stanford online? And do you know why this is going to work? Because Stanford, the business model, they turn away 99.9% .9 of the customers, right? You apply to Stanford, you don't get in. They take only a very small number of people in, right? But now they can actually turn it into a business. They can teach them online and then use that as an extensive program to figure out who's the best. And then they let them in on a scholarship, right? And so on. So this is going to have huge impact on the world. And this is literally, this is one year away, two years away before the business model falls out from underneath universities. And in fact, Sebastian said um, that he thinks within a decade there'll only be 10 universities left in the world. They'll be the best in the world with the best lecturers teaching engineering. They'll be the best in the world teaching humanities and so on. And you know, if you think about the inefficiencies, inefficiencies in the world today, the same subjects are being taught in the same universities all around the world with varying levels of quality, varying degrees of you know, you know, accuracy, and it's inefficient. Why can't I learn computer science one from the best lecturers in the world? And this is what we should be doing in Australia. We should be doing this in high school. We should be teaching computer science in high school. And if we don't, there's a steamroller coming with our name on it. Simultaneously, every industry is being digitized. If I design a house today, do it in a software package, I can email that file to a builder, an architect, or what have you, and get my house built. If I want to do financial research, it's an Excel spreadsheet. If I want to do copywriting, it's a Word document. If I want to design a part or a product, it's a CAD CAM package that I can load into a machine that will punch out a part. In fact, today, I received delivery of a MakerBot um, Replicator 2. I don't know if you guys know what this is. This is the future. It was like so exciting. The whole company was gathered around this box. We opened up, whatever, and it's a 3D printer, right? And you can basically plug it in and download designs and print out stuff in 3D, and it's amazing. And this is the way the world's heading, and this is the vanguard of, you know, you know within two years, it'll be on everyone's desktop at home. And you want to you make something, you hit a button and print it out in plastic or metal. So what that means is today... Um, chances are that just about any job you can think of can be done by someone on the other side of the world any time of day for potentially a fraction of the cost. And that's where my business kind of comes in. And um, we're the world's largest global labor exchange. We connect entrepreneurs on both sides of the equation. And the really magical thing about this is that we connect entrepreneurs being small businesses, which are traditionally under-resourced, but they're the backbone of most Western economies. So in the US, small businesses are responsible for more, more than half of non-farm GDP. Yet there's not a lot of stuff to really empower a small business owner running a cafe to get their job done, right? And what we do is we connect them with a the digital workforce to basically get anything done. And you're, at the moment, you're only limited by your imagination and what you can get done. And I'll explain in a second what I mean by that. At the same time, what we're doing is we're empowering a whole new class of entrepreneur, right, in developing countries, particularly across Asia, where they're going out and they are the elite of the elite of their country in technology, in technology by going online, starting companies and helping 
small business in the West get things done, whether it's graphic design, software, manufacturing, design, whatever it may be. We've got 4.3 million users, and that's growing rapidly, uh, exponentially. 2.6 million projects to date have been posted on the site. That's about $700 million worth of work. We've paid out about $160 million so far to date. Um, and this is $200 jobs. So these are lots and lots and lots and lots of jobs. And we're in the top 250, 300 websites globally, depending on the day of the week. And just a brief segue, 200 employees. Um, most of my company is actually in the Philippines. So I've got 140 people in the Philippines, 50 in Sydney. Um, one in Buenos Aires, three in London, and soon uh, in the US. Um, and we've acquired pretty much the entire mid-tier market in our space. And if it, software is eating the world, what we are doing I think is quite special because what we're doing is we are in the very early stages of replicating a country in software. This is our population, this is real data over the last 12 years, including the historical data from the, app, the acquisition of the sites we've bought. So we have an exponentially growing population just over to New Zealand. We have 22 regional sites and growing. Uh, so if you've got a Francia Chile at Francia.cl, we have a bilingual team that speaks Spanish. You can transact in Chilean pesos. You can, you can basically, you know, the whole site's in Spanish. And we've got, we'll have 20 languages before the end of the year. This is our economy. This is projects that are being posted. This is real data, again, growing exponentially. And this is what the global online economy looks like today. So primarily, it, the jobs are being posted from the US, about 50% of the jobs from the US, 10% from the United Kingdom, 7% from India. And the really remarkable thing here is the same thing that's happening in the BPO world with India, right? It all started you know, like 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, to an extent when American Express would outsource their call center to Bangalore. And um, you know, basically, you know, the, the customer support was done. So very you know, low level skilled jobs. Today, if you get a, um, go to the call center for American Express in India, what actually happens is if you're in the um, Manchester call center in the morning, you get a half hour training in um, language uh, with the accents and so forth, half hour of watching EastEnders. And then when the call comes in from Manchester, the heads-up display on your computer will be Manchester United soccer scores, uh, weather, local news, et cetera. And you can hold a conversation with the accent and no one knows the better. What's actually happened is more sophisticated jobs then start getting outsourced. So it went all the way through now to, you know, there's talk, you know, Merrill Lynch outsourced, you know, 60 PhDs in a research center to Bangalore and, and so forth. But where it's actually gone now is it's come full circle. The Indian companies now are going to places like Flint, Michigan and Detroit and setting up call centers, right? And they're hiring Americans to do the jobs. And so someone rings up, they get customer support. It's like, gee, they sound a lot like us, right? And so on. And the same thing's happening with my marketplace. So what's actually happening is the Indian companies that have done really well and got really good reputations and lots and lots and lots of feedback, they've discovered that it's actually easier and they make more money if they don't actually do the work, but they win the work and they subcontract out again. And so they, they'll come along, take a job, flip it. They'll do the customer support. They'll do all the quality control. I'll make sure it happens you know, you know, to, to spec. And, I, and you actually, at the end of the day, the customer actually gets a better outcome um, because there's someone in the middle who's just making sure that everything is perfect. And, but uh, so India now is the, seven, the, the third biggest poster of jobs. 7% of our jobs is actually go through the marketplace multiple times. Right? And then um, Australia, Canada, and so on. Australia is 4% of our business. The jobs are being done 34% from India, then Pakistan, Philippines, Bangladesh, uh, China, and there's a long, 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 long tail. And it's really interesting, I've got a video of this that actually shows this over time. Latin America is less than 2% of our business, but now we're in Spanish. This is all going to light up in the next year uh, in a big way. And this is actually from March, so it will be a lot more active now. But um, you know, we're in Spanish, we're in French, we're in German, we're in Indonesian, we're in um, Dutch, uh, Filipino, and uh, as of next week, Hungarian, um, Polish. Uh, I think we're doing Albanian. I mean, it's this on and on and on. This turnover will be about 50 million this year, actually. Um, uh, and growing 80% compound per year for the last four years. And this is an example of our workforce. So this is in Bangladesh. We actually ran a, ran a pretty simple contest on our site, which is basically just download a logo, print it out, and, and um, promote the logo in your local area. And these guys from Bangladesh actually were quite fanatical. They printed 3,000 T-shirts, 3,000 bandanas, 3,000 flags, and about a 2,000 square foot sign, and marched 3,000 villages into a stadium where they taught them my website and laptops. Uh, and you know, it's, it's um, emancipating women, actually, in work in many countries of the world. Uh, in this case, they've made a point of having the women march at the front um, because they can actually work from home and, and do things when, in cultures where it may not be you know, looked on in a, in a favourable light to, um, to actually be in the workforce and out there doing things and so on. Pakistan is the biggest town in Nepal, India, Philippines and so on. 
And it's interesting because at the same time as running a country and having an economy, we actually run a financial system. So we're actually the sole provider of bank accounts for many other freelancers. We issue cards. We issued you know, tens of thousands of these cards already, and I want to ramp that up dramatically. But in many cases, in someone in Bangladesh, this is maybe the only bank account they have. 15 currencies and growing. And you know, to give you an example, we've got more users on our site today than the two, two closest competitors combined, popularity and so on. So this gives you an example of the sorts of things people, people, doing, people are getting done on the site. So you know, three years ago, it was 20 job categories, and it was all IT related. It was software development, websites, SEO, graphic design, copywriting, and so on. Today, we have an astrophysics section, an aerospace engineering section, a biotechnology section, a genetic engineering section, manufacturing, and so on. There are 600 job categories and growing. This is an example of a, a, a job you can get done. You post this job, on average, you'll get 80 people bidding. Some jobs have thousands of people bidding. If I look today, there are probably about 50 jobs with 1,000 people bidding or more. In this case, design for me a fully functional June buggy. I can drive around at 30 kilometers an hour, right? $270. This is an example of the crowdsourcing. So rather than one-to-one -one outsourcing, this is crowdsourcing one-to-many. In this case here, for $300, this is an Australian company that got a logo designed. There were 300 examples that were uploaded. You can say, I like this, I don't like this, change the colors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for $300, you get 300 designs. In fact, for $300, I've seen 1,600 designs. But it's not just us. There's you know, the internet now with this sort of one-to-many relationships. There's some very interesting other business models that are out there on the internet. This is one called Kickstarter, and this is basically crowdfunding. So um, this particular example is a company that went to venture capitalists in the US, tried to raise money to build a watch, a Wi-Fi smart watch. And they got laughed at by the venture capitalists, right? Um, so in frustration, they went to uh, Kickstarter. They posted this project, and they said, we want to raise $100,000. And if you give us $150, we will send you a watch when it's ready. But we've yet to make it. $300 will send you two and an unsigned poster. I think something like $500, you can have a cup of tea with the, one of the founders for 20 minutes over Skype, uh, and so on. And they went to raise $100,000. Next thing you know, $10 million later, um, they had basically sold, um, pre-sold to 68,000 people these watches. And this is the future, right? Um, this is amazing. The Kickstarter now funds more projects than the National Endowment of the Arts, right, in the US, uh, and so on. And, you know, the music industry is discovering this now. There's, there's a whole bunch of industries, and this is, this is really changing the way you can fund projects. Um, so what's basically happening, the second macro trend is we're becoming hyper-connected, as Tom Friedman calls it. Third macro trend, distribution is unprecedented, right? If I look through the adoption of technology over the years, it took you know, 45 years I think, for the telephone to get adopted at 50% of US households and so forth. As we go through the fridge and the clothes dryer and color TV and so forth, you'll see how fast people are adopting technology, right? So 1900, less than 10% of families owned a stove, wide access to electricity or phones. 1915, less than 10% had a car. 1930, less than 10% had a fridge. 1945, less than 10% had a dryer and so on. Today, more than 90% actually have everything. Right? So technology is being adopted faster and faster and faster and faster. And if you look at it today, what I mean by technology being adopted, I mean customers are buying faster. Right? If I look at this graph and look at the iPod, you know, eight quarters to get to a few million units shipped, then the Sony PSP, then the Nintendo, and so forth, the Apple iPhone, you can see these graphs are getting faster and faster and faster as the technology is newer. Right? And if you think the iPhone was fast, look at the iPad and how fast that was adopted. 70 million units in eight quarters, right? The Android platform was adopted four times faster than the iPhone platform. If you think that's fast, look at Facebook, zero to one billion users slash customers in eight years. And if you think Facebook is fast, look at Cityville. These flat lines here, Facebook for iPhone, Facebook for Android, that's that graph there. One billion in eight years. And that's Cityville, a game in Facebook. 100 million users in 45 days. 100 million customers in 45 days. What's the business model behind this game? 98% of people don't pay, right? 2% of people pay. They decide for some reason that a virtual cow or farmyard is going to be somehow beneficial to their lives. Last year, $462 million in this game alone, right? It's all virtual as we you know, move away from the physical to the virtual world. And this parabolic growth is coming through, tapping into what we call distribution, what I call distribution fire hoses. And these are ways in which you can actually distribute products to customers faster than ever before in history. And 
This is an example of tapping into the, um, the Facebook Fihos. Obviously, Zynga, which makes Cityville and all these games, was the, was the master of this. But you know, you, you, for those of you who use Facebook, maybe a few months ago you saw, back in April, um, all this stuff on your feed about Viddy or Social Cam or The Guardian newspaper. And the business, model, the business model behind this was they tapped into it every few months. Zuckerberg will turn Facebook into a viral swamp by opening up some way in which applications can grow really quickly. In this case, it was the Open Graph API. And what they did with that, it was for you to read the Guardian newspaper, you had to install the app. When you read the, app, read the thing on the app, all your friends got spammed, you're reading this article. For them to then click on it and read it themselves, they had to install the app as well. You've got 300 friends, they've got 300 friends. Suddenly you have this exponential that's growing really, really, really quickly. In this particular case, video, which was a thing like YouTube, you see, you see a friend saying, I watch this video, it's really fun. You have to install the app, it spans all your friends, spans all their friends, spans all their friends, 300 times 300 times 300 times 300 times 300. 300. Viddy grew to 17 million users in seven days. You can't do this with conventional marketing. Uh, now that Firehose was getting into the app store early. Unfortunately, now there's 750,000 users, uh, sorry, apps in the, in the app store. But um, the companies have gone in quickly, made windfall profits. So um, one team of university students from um, Helsinki University came up with an idea for a game. They made the game, they got in the app store early, got ranked really high on the, on the, on the actual um, top games list, because just simply because there's no one else there when they got in last calendar, last year, calendar year, 75 million euros in revenue. The game, what was it? You flick little birds at pigs, 9 billion market cap valuation now. It's a private company, but it's, it's you know, 9 billion is, is the valuation of that company. Um, another fire hose is Google. 2 billion people on the internet, what do they do all day? They type things into Google, get blue links spat back at them. If you figure out how to tap into that fire hose, uh, you can do extremely well. There's a company that came up with an idea. What they did was they hired 13,000 freelancers. They generated content all day, every day. And next to the content, they put Google ads. And the content was quite quality content. It was things like how to tie a bow tie, how to lay carpet, how to you know, you know tie your shoelace. Um, they generated so much traffic to their websites, ehow.com and so forth, that it was uh, collectively the 17th biggest website on the internet, uh, responsible for about 20% of Google's revenue for ads on the ad network. That company called Demar Media went public, right, on 1.5 billion in revenue, right? It's now a multi-billion dollar company, 13,000 freelancers. There's other fire hoses, Reddit and so forth. Reddit's an example. If you haven't seen Reddit, it's the most powerful and most valuable media property in the world, in my opinion. This site is a social news aggregator. Basically what happens is you go to reddit.com and people submit articles. No one writes articles on Reddit, really. And people vote them up or down, that's it. And there's a category for world news, there's a category for politics, there's a category for technology, there's a category for cancer, there's a category for everything, right? There's a category for Sydney, there's a category for, you can, anyone can create a category, right? And just submit articles and vote them up or down. Um, I was on a bus with the director of innovation from News Limited about a year ago at Stanford and uh, at an executive program I was at. And he said, do you want to see a secret pro project that News Limited was working on? I go, what was it? He goes, a dual screen iPad. I go, have you heard of Reddit? He goes, what is that? It's some sort of site that college kids, you know, read. Go, yeah, but you, you know, what's your most valuable media, media property? He goes, Wall Street Journal. I said, they overtook you a year ago for traffic. He goes, but people just stay there looking at a joke. I go, and they stay twice as long on Reddit than they do on your site, right? And would you like to know how many staff they've got? One. Got bought by Condé Nast and so, um, and so forth. But so it's not an independent startup anymore. But it but, um, had $20,000 in funding to get going from Y Combinator, which is the, the Harvard of incubators. And today, I think it's the most powerful media property in the world. Barack Obama just did an AMA, which is Ask Me Anything. I am Barack Obama, President of the United States. Ask Me Anything. And they're like 30,000 people asking questions in real time, right? This is the future of media. This lady here, I thought it would be interesting to kind of mention it. She, um, she's, a hall monitor, she's a bus monitor in the US. And uh, she was on a bus and she was abused by all these kids. And she's been doing it for like 30 years, hasn't, hasn't had a holiday. And so um, all these guys on Reddit said, geez, She's been really abused in this YouTube video. We should you know, raise some money and kind of send her on a holiday. So they just put it on a little site and said, okay, we'll try and raise 5,000 bucks to send her on a holiday. 24 hours later, $703,000 are raised. She's probably in Dubai on some like gold-plated boat or something. But um, this is a fire hose as well. So there's a whole bunch of fire hose on the internet where basically you can tap into many, many, many people very, very, very quickly and, and so on. And so... What is actually happening today is there's, you go to these business, you go to these websites, and you go to Facebook and whatever, and you know, 
at freelance, I have no marketing team. I have no sales team. I have no advertising budget. I've got a growth team. And what the growth team does, actually, um, growth, what my growth team does is um, it's quite interesting. Um, it's run by a guy who's valedictorian in mechatronics, which is robotics. I have a quantum physics PhD in it. I've got some other robotics guys, computer scientists, mathematicians, stats. And this is what they do. Is they work out how to tap into these distribution fire hoses to grow really, really quickly, really, really fast. So when you go to Facebook and it says, hey, tell your friends about this and whatever, or buy a cow and impress your friends in this game, whatever, you think it's kind of fun and you know, a little bit innocuous and so forth, but actual fact there's some hardcore statistics behind it and actually what you are is you're a rat in a cage tapping a lever in a Skinner box. Um, these things are all very well designed by behavioral psychologists and mathematicians to basically figure out how to grow really, really quickly. This is the future of marketing. Four, every business today is an internet business. So the great thing about internet business, I mean every business sells through a website or they find customers on the internet. And the great thing about that is most things you need to build an internet business are free. Right, so Gmail is free. Your operating systems like Linux is free. Databases are free. Voice over IP is mostly free. Shopping cart software, there's free versions of that. There's graphic design software that's free. And what's not free, I'll tell you how, 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 how perverse it gets. This, I found this the other day. This is a, um, it's a VMware image. This is an image you can download into a computer or transform that computer into some other type of computer, right? Just has a little software. And this is a VMware image for a hotel. So you get a computer, you download this image, and it will run your PBX through voice over IP. You plug the internet in, all the phones are internet enabled, to do all that. Do your reservation system, do your mini bars, do the movies. It'll just stream the movies off the, off the server into the rooms, all the billing. Wi-Fi hotspots, everything. It's free, right? It's a hotel in a box for free. You just get the building, plug this in, go, right? Hire the staff. And what's not free is cheap. So ads on Google or Facebook to promote your business is cheap. Domain names are cheap. You know, issue a press release now online is cheap. It's a few dollars. And so on. And payment gateways like you know, PayPal and money bookers are cheap. And even if you don't understand any of it, you can use freelancers to do it cheaply for you now. And so what people are doing is they're starting companies off the back of a credit card. And that's why there's a whole new paradigm in venture capital in some sectors, particularly consumer internet, enterprise software, and so on, where instead of raising $5 million or $10 million in a Series A venture-style financing, they're raising $20,000, $50,000. Why Combinator? Classic example there, like the, 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 the sterling silver version of this in the US. Um, they've, you know, they, were, they funded, for example, Reddit with $20,000. They did Dropbox. Those of you who use Dropbox, it's like a six billion valuation at this point, gave them 20 grand, and so on. And um, they're funding companies 20 grand. Why? $20,000, you can fund four people in a room, feed them noodles for four months, and pop out the other side with a website or a mobile app. And if you've got traction, if you've got something that's got traction, that gets traction in the marketplace, there are two billion customers now on the internet, so you can go really quickly. Um, some examples. This is a classic example of what goes up, comes down. But um, this this site started with sixty bucks. Dig.com. It was it was an early version of Reddit, and um, they spent about ten grand in the first year, kind of paying for the hosting and stuff like that. Four years later, I mean, they've got about four offers on the way. They've got to two hundred million offer from Google. And they should have taken it. But they didn't, and it, it fell apart when they did a major re-architecture, which was a bit stupid. But um, yeah, this company was a you know, $200 million company that started with literally with 60 bucks. PC Tools, this is my partner and freelancer that gave me the first money to um, buy the first site. He uh, has a great business model for his business. It was basically free antivirus. You would go to get a, lap, a virus on your laptop, you'd go to Google, you'd type in antivirus, free antivirus. You'd go to downloads.com. You would download the number one download from downloads.com, which was Spyware Doctor. It was free, it would run on your laptop, it would take you 20 minutes of screwing around to find the application, it would take three hours to run. It would tell you, yes, you've got viruses, would you like me to remove them? You go, yes, it says, please insert your credit card, give me $49.95 per year. He bootstrapped this with no external financing, spent $1,000 of his own money hiring a team in India, outsourced to build the software, got up to 40 million in revenue, just sitting there clicking on Google AdWords and going back and you know, optimizing stuff with the software with the money he got, eventually hired a team locally here in Sydney, in North Sydney. He then raised a bit of money from Packer, and the, the reason why he, he, he did that was he, um, he said, you go into a room at these meetups, and when you're making a million dollars in revenue, there's a lot of people you could ask about questions and so forth. You, know, you go into the room again, when you're making $5 million in revenue, there's less people, but you can ask a few questions about stuff. Making $40 million in revenue, there's not many people in the room you can really ask a question of, so I needed to get some people around the table I could kind of do that with, so you got some... Some, some people in from, the, from there and um, got to 100 million in revenue and sold it to Symantec for 300 something million. He's about two or three years younger than me. He's retired, he lives in Switzerland. 
Uh, another example of an Australian company, start with 30 bucks. Go to a website, you can do this. What is it? It's coupons in a directory online. How do they get the coupons? They search Google. They search Google for coupons, they cut the coupons out, they build a website that looked nice, it was easy to search and good SEO. 30 bucks, no external financing, 30 million in revenue in five years, sold for 90 million. Right? Anyone can do this. The capital efficiency of the internet business model now is unprecedented. And you know, people talk about the internet and they go, oh, didn't we have the dot-com boom and the crash? You know, um, and so on back in 2000 and so forth. Well, you know, technology accelerates and keeps accelerating and the biggest company in the world today is a technology company, it's Apple and Google and look at Cisco and look at all these companies and so forth and you know, technology kept on going. What happened in the first dot-com crash was a capital markets phenomenon because the business models hadn't really caught up with technology and so what was happening was the main business model was ad internet advertising. And who was at buying the ads on these technology companies to advertise? Other technology companies that were raising gobs and gobs of money from listing on NASDAQ and, and so on. So when the capital markets pulled back and said, oh, I'm not quite sure about these business models, the funding dried up buying ads and so a bunch of business models collapsed. But the underlying technology continued to accelerate. And today, that's where we were, 50 million people in 1997 on the internet, today 2 billion. Right, let me tell you, we're going to prime time right now. In India, mobile internet now overtake, over, overtook um, desktop internet this year. And this trend will happen elsewhere, everywhere. And we're going to get to 5 billion by 2020. So we're going from 2 billion to 5 billion in the next eight years. So Twitter, zero to 300, I think 450 million users in six years. Facebook, zero to a billion users in eight years. Cityville, a game, zero to 100 million users in 45 days. If you've got something that's got, that's got affinity with the internet, or the customer base can take off really quickly. This is an example of Pinterest. You guys have heard of Pinterest? Scrapbooking, right? Yeah, eight months ago, nine months ago, I'd never heard of Pinterest, right? Came out of nowhere to the 16th biggest website in the US, scrapbooking online. And you know, let me tell you, I went to the last Y Combinator demo day and um, VCs were clamoring over each other because they discovered all of a sudden the dark matter of the internet is women. Because all these guys building these companies, they're all geeks, right? None of them have girlfriends. They don't really understand that 52% of the world is women. And they had, no one's been building stuff for women. So you've got ideas for basically for, 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 a, for a website that women like. You can, it's a huge opportunity right now. And you look at these companies, right? So Zynga, games inside Facebook, started 2007, financed 2008, makes stupid flash games. Last year, 1.2 billion in revenue. Groupon, I think you've all heard of that. Started late 2008, financed the next year. Last year, 1.6 billion in revenue, fastest organization in the history of mankind reached a billion dollars in revenue. If you look at the fastest growing company of their cohort, Apple, nine years to reach a billion dollars in revenue, Google, five years. Companies today are doing it in two and a half years, three years. It's not without reason that within um, our lifetime we will see a company reach a billion dollars of revenue in one year. And it might be four guys in a room, right, doing a billion dollars in revenue. How's that for interesting to think about? So the capital efficiency and the growth rates of the internet is unprecedented in history, but are we really ready for growth like this? And you kind of look at Zynga listed, and it's had a pretty um, unspectacular time in the stock market, down 86% from its peak. But the flip side of this is, I mean, how would you cope being a CEO of a company that you know, took one year to get financing and did a billion dollars of revenue two and a half years, in two and a half years, right? I mean, your company would be an absolute basket case. You wouldn't have the staff, you wouldn't have the management, you wouldn't have the strategy, you wouldn't have the business model, you wouldn't have... The, no, I mean, it's like it just, these companies must be absolutely insane to work for where there was nothing two years ago and all of a sudden there's you know, 10,000 people, 5,000 people, right? And so on. So, interesting times. Welcome to the technology.